<laughs> well, it's, it's uh, really wonderful to be here. When we retired two years ago, um, they had just started building this building. So it's very nice to stand here in, in front of you in Rose Hall and to, te to talk about really one of my favorite topics, which is the teaching of science. So it's, it's rare that you pick up a newspaper nowadays and science ed isn't somewhere uh, being discussed, right? And um, so nowadays we're, we're talking about STEM and we're talking about uh, competing in the, the global marketing marketplace and we're talking about being behind in our test scores. But you know, in my day it was Sputnik and keeping up with the Russians who had just gotten ahead of uh, the Americans. This seems to be a long, um, how can you say, a, a place of anxiety because this wish to know the world, um, you just don't want to be ignorant, do you? <laughs> it's the, one wants to feel with knowing comes power, which is an interesting um, a partnership, which I want to speak about some more as we go on. Um, and it's very, very important to our time to feel that our children, as they grow up, that they have this knowledge and grow into this power which that knowledge brings. I think there's another, um, that's always been there. And there's, there's kind of an anxiety about it. But I think today the need to be literate in science has become more and more urgent. And I, I just tell you a story of uh, a friend of mine whose daughter was about to have her first baby. And she was having a great deal of anxiety, actually, thinking about whether or not to save stem cells uh, during the birth and have them frozen in case that child should need it at some point. Of course, it's, it's a, uh, an expensive procedure, um, but here it is, a, a young mother. What young mother would have to worry about that, right? So you, you begin this what you eat and what supplements you want to take and what, whether this climate debate, you're listening all the time to scientific evidence. And I think to, in today's world, if our children or even you yourself, myself, we have these discussions all the time, um, if you don't feel that you have uh, the vocabulary and the way of looking at the evidence and coming up with a, a sound judgment, you feel a little bit powerless. You feel a little bit left behind. So science is in our time a really important element in the field of our endeavor of knowledge. And I, I can assure you that nowhere um, in Waldorf education is science Science is one of the most, not one, the most important theme in the education. Rudolf Steiner said, we need to teach the children how to think because there and only there are we really free as human beings. And that capacity, um, nourishing that capacity is really at the root of, of science being able to think in an objective and in a clear way. And so it really sits as a center of all we do in the Waldorf School. And science actually has this meaning of to know. Scio, I think, is the, the Latin root of the word, which means to know. And Rudolf Steiner really wanted children to know in a very deep, and multifaceted way. So if you've heard me give this little um, metaphor before, please just listen to it once again because I, I haven't found a better one. But if you think of what it is to know the world, 
Ralph Steiner also said, to know the world, you can't know yourself until you know the world. And uh, you'll find the world if you know yourself. So there's this wonderful uh, connection between becoming a whole human being and knowing the world. So that's the, that really is the aim of science, is, is to, to know the world. And the question is, what does knowing the world mean? And I just wanted to give you this, this image. Um, if I have a wonderful tree in my backyard and I go and I investigate, I'm a chemist, so the lignin that makes up the, the um, fabric of the wood, I, I see how in the leaf the, the um, cells are layered and there's spaces between the cells to allow the movement of carbon dioxide and water through it, where the chloroplasts are placed, how the tree is actually rooted and the, the structures and the cells that help absorb the nutrients from the ground. The list can go on and on. There are so many incredible, wonderful things to know about the structure and how a tree is actually put together. And that's one kind of knowledge I, I would call it cognitive, right? You go in and you find how is this made up and why does it work and how does it work? So that's one kind of knowledge. I would put to you that there's a totally different way of knowing that tree if I come to it as an artist. Maybe I want to draw it and I observe it in the morning and the noon time in the evening in the setting sun and I start to think how am I going to draw this tree and I look at how it's placed in the in its landscape I look at how the the branches reach out and what gesture they make and start to maybe even listen to the sound that the leaves make in the wind and I when I draw that tree or maybe compose a piece of music that is inspired by that tree, I have also gotten to know it, but in a completely different way from cognitively getting to know it. I think there is also a third way of knowing. And this, this one is, let's say, you have a favorite tree. I don't know if any of you had a tree that, or a place um, in the woods as a child maybe that you, you grew up with. I had a poplar tree in the back of our, our yard that we planted when it was very small and it grew quickly. And it was just a place I liked to sit with my book. And when I started keeping a journal, I often would sit there and journal in the afternoons after school. And I really, as I grew, this tree grew. And how can you s say, I, well, I'm just going to say it the way I felt it. I experienced over time and as I, as I grew up, uh, close to this tree, it was my friend. I had a, a sense of the being of this tree. It's another kind of knowledge. It's very different from the artistic the feeling into the gesture, it's, it's very inward. I would call it an intuitive kind of knowledge. And all three are very, very important to knowing the world as a human being. All three levels are actually at work in us all the time. We might not be that aware of it, but we're always working on an intuitive level we're working on a kind of an artistic eye where you're taking in the whole thing and having a feeling for what lives there. And then you're zeroing in also quite cognitively on the details. And all three levels of knowing are very important uh, in knowing the world. If you have only one or the other, you're a little bereft. It isn't a nice round circle. So. It was Rudolf Steiner's genius, I think, to realize that these three ways of knowing the world really um, 
our particular capacities or talents that children have at develop differently at different times in their, in their um, growing up. And our children, when, as, as uh, Lisa so beautifully described, when they're little in, in this sort of early childhood stage, when they are just in nature and digging or watching something that they hadn't seen before, or balancing something, or digging a hole and seeing how deep it will grow, there is this intuitive oneness with the space in which they, they uh, are at work. And that, that is a, a knowing, a learning to know, which occurs at a very deep level in, in, the, in their own experience. And in the, in the grade school, um, you, you, you know, oh, I have this wonderful story of, of a uh, uh, kindergarten child who, this comes from a kindergarten teacher who said, well, when the kindergarten children are always doing things that their teacher does, and uh, often when they see you sweep, oh yeah, my daughter did this also. So I would sweep the floor in the kitchen and then she would come and get the, the broom also and she would sweep, but her sweeping was <laughs> just spreading the, the, she swept all right, but the, <laughs> the dirt went in every which way. She was just interested in this movement that she saw. And, but at one point that moment comes where she said, can you show me how to sweep? And then you see this incredible shift in consciousness where it's not just an activity, but there's a purpose to the activity. And, and she sees it from a different, it's a whole different perspective. And that happens around that six-year-old when the child moves into the grade school. So here now you begin to know the world more in this artistic way. Children, young children, um, ask questions all the time and they love to know where and when and how, um, but they, they really want to, um, how can you say, they have this ability to really observe and take in the whole, not yet all the little pieces. So I, I have another story because this is one that, that um, was in my own experience, second grade. Uh, one of the little girls in my class came running in and said, Mrs. Kurth, Mrs. Kurth, come outside. So I came outside and she pointed at the, at the sky and she said, Mrs. Kurth, why is the sky so blue? And I am. I'm a scientist, trained like a scientist, <laughs> but I had been in Waldorf training for quite a while already. <laughs> and I thought to myself now, do I, do I give her a lesson on diffraction or reflection? Or and as I was looking up, I said to her, it is so blue, isn't it? And she said, yes. It's like a mantle. And if I had said anything else to her, I wouldn't have gotten that beautiful image. And this child, when we got to eighth grade meteorology, and we spoke about this, this wonderful mantle, which is our atmosphere, right? She had an experience of it, which which now met this other more cognitive knowledge, which gave it a depth and a wonder, which perhaps otherwise would have been explained away. Right? We, we even say that, you explain something away. But this way, this beautiful blue mantle lived with her and gathered, how can you say, depth over the years as she, she came to know it. And then I, I put up the Waldorf uh, science curriculum here because then in, 
if you, if you look at it, you really kind of see how we're moving from this very experiential uh, knowing of the world, just being in it, that's your early childhood. In grade one and two, nature speaks, the animals speak, the little brook speaks, it gets tired running all day, and, and it, it really complains and complains and complains, and the sun gets tired of listening to this, and says, well, all right, and withdraws some of its warmth, and this brook freezes solid, and how happy it is when the sun comes back and it can jump again. So those are, those are nature stories, which then later in chemistry, when you're speaking about crystalline structure and you're speaking about kinetic energy and its relationship to the warmth, then that phenomenon has a whole other layer to it if this experience was part of their childhood. So grade three, something happens in the third grade, right? I, you, you see a difference in the faces. The hands sometimes go much more into the pockets. They, they lengthen. They kind of look around a little bit. Something has changed. They uh, have made a little more distance to the world. In the stories of the Old Testament, which they hear, they get kicked out of paradise. You remember that part? But the exciting part about being kicked out of paradise is that you get to go to the earth. And what do you do on the earth? You have to farm and you have to build houses and you get to be capable right here with your feet on the ground. And this is something that lives in the third grader. So they go into farming and house building. And then as you go looking further and further into the world, in fourth and fifth, you start, uh, sorry, in fourth grade, you start by looking at the animals, because aren't the animals closest to a child? I mean, if, where do they feel the most connection? Few children nowadays don't have a pet or haven't at least had a pet slug <laughs> or an earthworm. They love those too. And all of those experiences. So you begin by stories there, but they're very close stories. You know, if you speak about the eagle that is able to just swoop down in a fraction of a second seeing um, a mouse running through the through the uh, grasses, what incredible sight and how fast they are. And you can always ask the children, well, is there anything in the human being that moves as fast as, a, as an eagle diving to get a mouse? And they often tell you, oh, yeah, I can do that in my thought, right? So, so you build this, this connection between the natural world and their experience of themselves and the world around them. And next to animals that are so close to them, then come the plants, this thing that's rooted in the earth and reaches up into the sun and somehow embodies both in its, its actual physical being. And you see then, all of a sudden, you, we move into what um, would be more recognized as science subjects, right? Although I think the study of the plants, you know, we really do look also at the, the fungi and, and the ferns and look a little bit how the, the plant kingdom develops right up to the flowering plants. But real sort of science as it's known out there in the world with physics and chemistry and biology starts in sixth grade. And there is something now um, waking up in the child. It's, it's the beginning of adolescence, right? <laughs> when you have sixth graders? <laughs> Aha, am I right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there, there's this, this other thing. And what's so fabulous about those first science lessons is that they're looking at things that they're absolutely familiar with. 
you know, like the sound that their violin makes. But it's as if they're seeing it for the first time because they're looking at it not from within, but stepping back a little bit and rediscovering it. And what a wonderful moment that is when the students are able to do that. Wow, you know, I've been playing this, this um, violin all the time and I never thought about the fact that when that string shortens and when I press harder, on, you, that the sound, sorry, that the pitch goes up. And if I press harder, the, the amplitude, the, the, the sound, the amount of sound goes up. Those things that all of a sudden, it's something they've known all along, but it, it awakens. There's been an experience that awakens into the, into the consciousness. And this is this, uh, the physics in six, seven, and eight, you're always doing that. Now, they don't, in, in sixth grade, you have that awakening to what's familiar. All right, seventh grade, they've already had that, right? Now, tell me some more. So then you begin to measure it. You start to quantify it, you know, the, the actual length of the string and the, the um, ratios of the intervals and so on. You, you uh, measure uh, in mechanics the distance of, to the fulcrum and the weight on either side of your, of your uh, lever. All of those things, you start to really uh, think of, well, how is this working? And by the time you get to eighth grade, well, why should I know this? <laughs> You know, what, why, why is this so important? Why, why do you want me to know? But there, uh, the eighth grader has, has really this incredible longing to, to be in the modern world and anything that you bring him that he or she can also do, that they, they build uh, small motors, that they begin to understand how the ele electricity actually comes into their house, how a circuit breaker works, very interested in very practical things. How do they do things out there in the world so that they have this sense, I am in the world, and you see this journey that they have begun from just being in the world to now being, what is it, a certain kind of mastery, a certain kind of knowledge, a certain sense of security through knowing. So that's, that's been a journey, and you see also how it's gone from a rather intuitive sense to an artistic sense to a cognitive uh, knowing. And the, I think the trick is, and this is a, a little bit of a trick, <laughs> is to make sure that as you move from one to the other, the, other, the first is not lost. That it's really a foundation which is constantly uh, underneath the knowing that comes. So then we move into the high school. And um, the high school, every year, Every student, not the ones that are going to, just the ones that are going to be math and science, but every student looks at some realm of physics, some realm of chemistry, some realm of biology, and also earth science. Um, I didn't put the astronomy, I don't know whether you could call astronomy earth science. It's a kind of, astro it's kind of an earth science, right? And uh, in grade 11, I should have put ecology uh, that goes with the botany. So you have an earth science, you have a, a biology, you have a physics and a chemistry lesson every, every year. And every student um, has to take that up just as they all sing and they all paint and so on. Because it's part of being a human being, especially in our time, to have a certain scientific literacy. Now, I, can't, I could say a lot about, um, you know, why we teach what we teach in those four grades. Maybe I can just give a few, um, 
how can you say, concepts, right? In ninth grade, your ninth graders are all over the place. You know, they, they're long and the voices have dropped and they're a little bit clumsy and they're, they have a tendency to be somewhat loud and then you have some that are much too quiet. There's sort of a, a swinging, a kind of finding themselves and it's, it's, it's a little noisy and it's a little raucous in the ninth grade. So the, there is an underlying theme in the ninth grade that when is looking at extremes, that come to a balance. So uh, that's easy to see in, in thermodynamics. We're very hot and very cold and how you can harness the energy in order to get your steam engine or whatever else you can, you can work with the hot and cold in order to, to um, create all kinds of machines and so on. In plant chemistry, it's the great building up and the great breaking down, right? The, the, the uh, photosynthesis brings carbon dioxide and water. How? They, they never really believe me that a tree is made up of carbon dioxide and water, but I, I try very hard to convince them. <laughs> Comes down and builds the plant substance, and on the other side, the, the plant and animals breathe in the oxygen, break it up, and we live on the sunlight, the sun energy, which is released in the process. So these two great um, cycles, and then, of course, all of their differentiation. We don't just break down. We make alcohol and we make esters and so on and so forth. So you, you have this building up and breaking down in ninth grade. In 10th grade, perhaps one could say the theme is more harmony. After all of these long limbs and, and coming out of 8th grade and coming to 9th grade and so on, there's a little bit of a, a, a harmonious moment, well, sometimes, <laughs> in 10th grade. And uh, so we're, we're looking more at, at something that has, has balance within it. So um, the physiology and embryology, how, how a, a body actually comes to be. Um, there's also uh, the reproductive system is in there where you have the, the male and the female as something which unites in order to create a new, a new being. And uh, in mechanics, it's all about balance, acids, bases, and salts are acids on one side, bases on the other, and the salt is the balance between the two. And climatology, what a lesson in, in balance, right? The, the air and the oceans are always moving from cold to warm and from warm to cold in order to bring some kind of circulation and balance to the whole picture. Uh, in 11th grade, um, this, uh, you're, you're really, asking the, the question, ooh, and I forgot what I named that. Hmm. Uh, it's, oh yes, it's analysis, right? You're really looking at, in botany, at all the different classes of, of, um, of plants and how species are determined, electricity and magnetism, in atomic theory, you're really analyzing Whereas in 12th grade, it all gets put back together in a, in a synthesis. So we have an entire journey there. And this whole um, area in the, from 9th to 12th grade is really work in the cognitive realm, but always on this foundation of what is artistic and also what is intuitive. So when I should have perhaps brought, uh, I, I'm always hesitant to do that, but one of my students were just in the 11th grade with atomic theory, and uh, some of the students just spontaneously wrote a poem when we were discussing the fact that matter or the atom is actually empty space. I mean, it's such an incredible uh, fact that you have to try to get your mind around. And there's this tiny, tiny nucleus, has all the 
the weight and all the positive charge, and then there's this huge empty space and there are few electrons floating. <laughs> We're not quite sure how or where, maybe they're really waves. It's this picture of, of what matter is, and it really, it really inspired them, you know? It's, we thought, well, what, what does that mean if that's what matter is? And, you know, and so there's a question that comes up, and they don't just have it as a model. They have it as a feeling also, and they, they carry it as, as a question. So one of the things that Rudolf Steiner uh, gave us as Waldorf teachers, he says, you have to really think carefully how we get to know anything. And he says, well, you always start with experience, right? You have to experience something. But then you have to observe your experience because we, we see a lot of things that we don't look at, <laughs> right? So you have to make that, that big step from just seeing to looking and to observe it carefully and to bring a little bit of interest to to the observing. And um, then um, when you look at something carefully, I don't know if you have this experience, usually a question comes like, what is that? <laughs> or whatever, or ah, oh, that's so beautiful. You know, when we were, were uh, doing flame tests or uh, looking at spectra um, uh, last week, I mean, they say, wow, you know, so, and a, and a question, well, what, what does it say? And then um, you start to think about, well, what could it be? And what other things do I know like that? And so uh, a kind of judging, what could it be? You know, what other things do I know? What could I bring to this experience? And then out of that questioning, out of that judging, comes, if you're lucky, some understanding. But I, I just read an article by a, a former Waldorf student who is now a, a, a medical doctor uh, who said, and don't forget that it's really good to be wrong now and then. You know, that you, you have these ideas and you have this judgment and you make a really nice knit um, explanation, and maybe it's wrong, you know, and you should be open to that as a possibility. That's also in there. So those are the, the steps of knowing something, and very, very important, said Rudolf Steiner, is after you've observed, after you've experienced something and observed something, and had a few thoughts about it, Go to bed, sleep on it. Let it sit in you unanswered for a little while, overnight. And then the next day, come back to it. Bring it back in your imagination and then begin to work on it. And understanding will grow. And it's even if the understanding doesn't come to the right answer right away, there's, you've, you've put a seed in the soil uh, in that way. So um, we, I thought uh, that we would, we would experiment with this way that Rudolf Steiner said to teach a phenomenon, that you get to understand something by having a look at, um, we'd actually just do it, uh, at Crook's tube, Mr. Crook who uh, was the first person who made this tube, was very interested in the newly found uh, phenomenon of electricity. And what we have here is a tube, and on both sides of the tube are two electrodes, and um, we're nothing between them except air at the moment. And we're going to try, we're going to put a high voltage current into this, into these electrodes and see uh, what electricity is like, right? It's going to have to go in that gap and maybe we can have a look at it and see what it's like. 
the 11th graders had the experience of a um, zinc electrode and a copper electrode, one in a copper sulfate solution, one in a zinc sulfate solution. This had a little porous cup around it. And if you connect it to a galvanometer, all of a sudden you get a current. A current? What? Where'd that come from? What, what's flowing? But the, the little needle went... Mm. Well, it wasn't too exciting, was it? So we thought, well, um, what if we could have a look at this thing that's flowing? And it's, it's a little bit of a leap, I, I uh, have to admit, because you need a very high voltage source <laughs> to make anything flow across a gap from there to there. And you need one other thing, is you need to get the air out of there because the air stops this current from flowing. So we also attach to it a um, vacuum pump, which makes a lovely glugging noise. And um, as the air is sucked out of that tube, you're going to see something. So we're going to just try it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yes. So James, will you do the the pump, or can shall I reach around? I know. <laughs> so this is my famous assistant. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to put the voltage on? Here? Okay. So switch on. Still see it. Yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah. yeah. All right, that's perfect. We're at four. So I put the voltage on, and we are now sucking the air out of this tube. We actually could use all those lights off, right? We can't kill the exit yeah, lights. Okay. That's okay. Let me see from there we go. We have a leak. Right. Don't know if we'll get it to change it's anymore. Trying. It's trying. There we go. I think this is as far as it goes. Um, I always do tell the students, because it's very relevant, that if we got all the air out of it, the whole tube would be as dark as that little space here. You would have that purple glow, but it would, it would be, um, there wouldn't be these pockets or these little disks of light. All right. <clears throat> Should we just turn off the pump? I don't. I can't feel where the switch is.
could watch it go. Sometimes the air just leaks back in a little bit. It's okay. Turn off the light again for a moment. It's kind of nice to see it go backwards. So the pump's off and we, we don't have a perfect seal. So this Crookes tube was also called a cathode ray tube. And this side is the cathode, or the negative pole, of the electricity. And um, what's your left-hand side (laughs) is uh, the positive pole. We're just letting a little air back in. No? Okay, I'm going to switch it off. Now we could have lights. Now if you were my 11th grade class, I'd like to do it just as I would with them now. Let's just go over what we saw. Just think back what it was you saw. So we, we turned the lights off, we turned the voltage on, and we turned the vacuum pump on. So what happened? Yeah? What did it look like? Right? Yeah. What did it look like? Mm-hmm. What did it look like? Yeah. Vibration. Or Vibration. Did it have a color? Oh, yeah. What color? Purple. So where was the purple? There was, there was a purple glow here. Mm-hmm. And then what, what, was go- what was the color going across? A kind of a peachy color? right? Luminous. It's interesting that if the lights are on, we hardly see a thing, right? You, you really have to put out this world in order to see that world. And then, and then how did it change over time? Because that was the first thing, right? Sort of flash. And then how does it change over time? You can just shout out. Starts pulsing. What starts pul- pulsing? that this color, right? And um, what, is, what does that pulsing part look like? Like little disks, yeah? Luminous disks. Are they the same orange that first flashed across? No. no. What, how is it different? Because you change something Yeah, but how is it different? I mean, the, the color, how's the, how has the color changed? It's lighter, right? It's a, the, the one was more orange, the other one a little more pink. Okay, so, and then what else is, is changing? So we've got a different quality, and what else is changing? It, what got? There are spaces between the, that are quite distinct at one point. And then what, there's another space. Where, where was, there was purple, and then, was there, s- there a kind of a black space right there, right? And was anything happening at this end that you, you noticed? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> yeah, they, they feel like they're moving in that direction. They're kind of doing this, right? And then they go back and forth. And uh, I don't know, I observed sparking there. Did anybody else observe sparking at that disk? Whereas here it's kind of a glow. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. It really does. It it looks like it's... (laughs) And then it... it, it (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't... We forgot to show the magnet. Never mind. 
<laughs> we brought a magnet because that's very interesting to see what happens. What Would you like to see it? What happens when you put a magnet to it? All right. That's, a, that's what we need to do. Yeah. Okay, I'm just, can we have the lights to get off again? I haven't got my... It's a strong magnet. So the north, the north end of the magnet is facing you right now. <laughs> and now the south end of the magnet is facing you. Do it again. North. Cool, huh? I love that ah. <laughs> I love those little discs. So, um, what in the world are we looking at? Now you go home and have good sleep on that. <laughs> right? Because that's, that's now, um, you have an experience like that and you you really think, well, what in the world is it? And there is no greater scientific, how can you say, force in a human being than to have that kind of a question. A really, you've seen something and you just don't know what it is and you wonder about it, right? And then the next day, especially, and it's important to spend that time just going over what it was we saw, because sometimes people see different things. And you have to <laughs> just do it again and say, well, was it, was it orange or was it purple or where was, was what? So uh, you have to check that out, that it's, that it's really accurate. And then you start saying, well, what do you think it was? So you said a manifestation of electricity you know, or force. So what's that? How many of you know all the answers to these questions? Harlan's not allowed to answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, the electrons move from the negative to the positive. He knows all the answers. So, I don't know if an 11th grader would have come up, up with it that fast, right? <laughs> but we kind of look at it and we know there's electricity in this tube because we've, we've switched on this wonderful machine. And we know we've taken a lot of air out to make it possible for whatever this electric force is to move across. So the first thing that children usually say, or the students usually say, is that we're seeing the electrons. We're seeing the electricity, Mrs. Kurth. And, and then we, we stop for a moment and say, 
How do you know? How, how can you be sure? Right? So how do, you, how do you know that it's not the electrons that we're seeing? You said it was the air. The what? How do you know that? Electrons wouldn't emit light. They do in the hydrogen molecule when they get excited. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Is there something that you see there that might make you realize if we could see the stream of electrons that that phenomenon would not look the way it does? If these highly energized electrons were somehow visible, were emitting light, right? We wouldn't have a big black space there. And then these black spaces in between the disks of light. And of course, the, the crux is that I told them that if the tube was really empty, it would be dark and just the the glass radiates a little bit, right? So then the question is, if it's not the electrons that we're seeing, what is it that we're seeing? Where's the light come from? Well, what else is in the tube? (laughs) Just air. So if it's not the electrons, then it must be the air that's left. And then you think, oh, Okay, but there's little disks of air that glow, and then there's little black spaces in between. How could that be? What would make the air shine? And I actually, you know, (laughs) even with 11th graders, you you can just bump into them until they start to scream. I say, that's it. (laughs) That's, That's the air when they get bumped enough so that they emit light. We, we go into releasing it uh, when we look at the spectroscopy to see that they're actually emitting certain energy levels as they fall back into their, into their ground state. But that, then you, you slowly uh, build this picture of what is actually happening. You see something and this whole phenomenon becomes complete. Um, as you really wrestle with it in your thoughts. And it's question after question, and there has to be some pondering, and there has to be some, some mistakes also, you know, where, where you, you think, well, if it was that way, well, what about this? And you, you work it through. This, this is the core of, of what learning science is. And, um, I have to add to that that one of the most important things is that, wow, (laughs) we put a magnet to it and these, all of a sudden you you get this arc, well, what is that? Why is that? Are you not allowed to say? (laughs) Why do the, why do those discs respond? Um, It, yeah, go ahead then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. We had the technology. You, you guys, you have to come to these courses. So the, they wouldn't respond if the electron had no charge, right? So, or whatever's moving. I mean, for a long time, these were just called cathode rays. But it's this experiment that led J.J. Thompson to his famous experiment where he determined the charge to the mass of the electron, uh, oh, the charge to the mass for the electron. So um, this, this then started a whole bunch of other experiments which allowed us to know some of these things. So um, the, the magnet, of course, and they would have had this in eighth grade, right? Every magnet has an electric field around it. And, 
and if you, you put a magnet to this electric charge, then it's going to align itself with the, with the electric field. And I'm always trying to remember, is it the left thumb rule or is it the right thumb rule? So I'm not going to go there <laughs> because I don't have to teach that in chemistry. But um, that, that this uh, movement to the, to the magnet uh, is another, is another um, proof that we're seeing that there is a moving charge uh, in the tube. So I just, I, I hope that was an experience since we, we talked about what does it mean to learn in this way. Very often, I mean, Waldorf education is often criticized for not bringing science early enough and for not bringing enough facts. And um, if a fact is brought before you have questioned and before you have pondered and before you have wrestled a little bit, it's kind of like getting a brick and the piece of knowledge is a brick that you now have to carry around. When you go through this process and now you have a feeling of, a, of an electric current as something moving um, between, po between negative and positive and it has energy, it can accelerate, it can excite uh, air molecules to, to um, emit light. If you have that, then now I have an understanding which actually wants to grow. I want to know more, <laughs> right? And that's very, it's a very different experience. Um, answers which children get before they are able to question and before they are able to wrestle their way uh, to an understanding, um, it, it dies on them. And so often uh, the difficulty we have in our higher education in, in high school is that so many kids say, well, I'm not a math and science person, right? But we're all math and science people, you know, because the, the phenomenon in the world excite us, right? I mean, even if you're not a scientist, it's kind of, this is neat. And it's really nice to be able to, to understand it. And um, I think, I think it's, it's that element uh, which Waldorf education brings to a science education, which is so important that, that it really has the whole human being involved and that you don't think, that you don't experience it as a bunch of stuff that you have just memorized, but that it is an, an understanding which is growing in you. And uh, I don't know who said it, it's in my notes, and it might have been me, <laughs> but um, it sounds like it could have been somebody else. Um, uh, I, I wrote, knowledge that is unaccompanied by imagination and also human value, human intuition, is a little bit like a car going full speed without a driver because we do have a tremendous amount of uh, power through the knowledge that we have of the, of the natural <coughs> world. But if the whole human being, not just his cognitive, his or her cognitive self, but also their artistic and their intuitive self, isn't somehow involved in this knowledge, then it can go badly awry. And it also, um, is I don't think up to the task of facing the many problems which our scientists need to, to solve in this millennia. I think we all feel that. And I think here in this school, as the children go through their science curriculum, that is developed in them. So when they look at a question, should I save the stem cells from, for my child who is about to be born, that they have something in themselves with which they can judge which is right for them. Because they know how to look and observe and to ponder, 
and to question and to come to some understanding. So that is my speech on Waldorf science and thank you so much for listening to <laughs>